If you run a Google search using the term high power hammer bite, you may find images if you click on images um, at the uh, Google search engine, such as we found when we searched high power hammer bite. Here's a picture of a, really a normal grip hold on a high power pistol, but you see how the hammer is into the hand here. When this slide comes rearward, it's going to additionally press this hammer down. Uh, this picture was from the same search. This kind of shows you uh, either the consequence of or the defense of a uh, high power hammer bite in this uh, shooter's hand. And the subject that, uh, that we're taking on here is the high powers beaver tail design. And specifically, uh, we're going to have a question. So is this thing called hammer bite with the high power a thing? Yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> I've personally experienced it myself and over the years multiple manufacturers and custom shops have altered the high powers beaver tail to address this problem. Here's how Nighthawk Custom did it. Here's how the Israeli uh, Kareen high power um, did it. These are their versions of a high power beaver tail. Now the trade-off uh, for these beaver tails is the handgun becomes less concealable and it requires a specific carry angle from any holster so the beaver tail does not interfere with fast deholstering. So we're asking what may be a controversial question. Is the FN Browning High Powers beaver tail dysfunctional? This is BH Spring Solutions LLC, bhspringsolutions.com, High Power University. I'm Mark Allen. Let's get started. Is the FN Browning High Powers beaver tail dysfunctional? First of all, we define handgun beaver tail as a sometimes multi purpose portion of a semi automatic pistol located at the top rear of the grip frame. The beaver tail may, this is what a, in essence, a beaver tail is and what it does. It may double as a grip safety. It may influence positive positioning of the hand on the pistol's grip frame. It can potentially act as a counterbalance or leverage point for recoil control. And in the case of a cocked hammer carry uh, or condition one, a beaver tail may serve to, quote, hide the cocked hammer. Um, or reduce snagging when producing a weapon from underclothing. However, the most basic function of the semi-auto pistol beaver tail, and when we say beaver tail, we're also going to include handguns that don't necessarily have a quote beaver tail, but have a grip frame design that is designed to do this basic core function, and that is to protect the shooter from the violence of reaction of the action that is occurring directly above the shooter's hand. And we're going to define for our purposes of this question the word dysfunctional. There's lots of synonyms for dysfunctional, but our meaning in that uh, question, um, is the high powers beaver tail defective, flawed, maladjusted, uh, unfit? Now, um, it, again, is this subject a thing? And, and you can have some disagreements about this entire subject because there are quite a few folks who um, take the position the high power is perfect as it is as it was designed initially right out of the box and nothing needs to be changed um, however uh, popular online web forum discussions about beaver tails and hammer bite with respect to the high power pistol would say that is not uh, the case. This is not a perfect out-of-the-box pistol. Here's what one user said. For me, the only justification for a beaver tail is that my big fat hands suffer mightily from snake bite. He's calling hammer bite snake bite because it <laughs> frankly is kind of similar feeling. And in the end, all I care about is the web of my hand not bleeding profusely. Another um, <clears throat> high power owner said, I love my high power pistol except for the hammer bite reason mine hasn't been out of the safe in years and that's really too bad so our question is the browning high powers beaver tail dysfunctional um and we're going to give a hint to the answer uh to this question a functional beaver tail 
uh, affirmatively creates a no-go zone for the shooting hand. And this is a concept in firearms design that we're going to introduce you to as we are, uh, as we are looking at this question. Again, here's uh, another um, from the Google search, high power hammer bite. This shows, again, a normal grip hold, but there's something going on right here. What's going on is the web of the hand right here in that skin. This slide's gonna come back. This is gonna come down more. And in the instance of these two photographs, um, there is gonna be a result. Um, the best case scenario in those top two photographs, it's gonna hurt. Worst case scenario, blood and injury to the hand. Uh, the shooter in the photo with a bandage on his hand, that's his approach to handling high power hammer bite or the injury. Um, and so again, is the high powers beaver tail dysfunctional? We want to look at the high powers beaver tail from a historical design perspective. And believe it or not, this is a relatively easy thing to do with FN. And we are speaking specifically about the FN Browning high power and its design is the beaver tail dysfunctional. There were three primary designers of handguns for FN from around 1899 um, until 1993. And we have those three here on this page. Here's John Browning at BH Spring Solutions. We affectionately refer to Mr. Browning as God with a small G, um, of course. But so John Browning is God. Here's Leon Hubert. Uh, he was FN's last metal frame uh, handgun designer. And between those two gentlemen was Diodane Save. Diodane Save is going to be some of the subject of this video because Diodane Save is the designer, was the designer of the FN P35 high power. It loosely is called the Browning high power. That was good for marketing purposes for sales uh, for FN. Diodone Save designed the FN Browning High Power. Um, were we talking more about Diodone Save today than uh, many times uh, we normally would? On or around the time Diodone Save was leaving FN, and we believe that to be late 50s, 1950s time frame. That was the time when Leon, uh, Leon Hubert was uh, joining FN, and we loosely um, and affectionately, of course, call Leon Hubert God's grandson. Um, and the interesting thing is these two gentlemen, um, do not have a history of creating handgun designs that, um, uh, create pain or injury for the user. In fact, they, they are completely clear of this aspect of, uh, or this nuance in handgun design. And frankly, most other handgun designs and most other companies don't share this this issue of hammer bite or slide bite. So um, taking a look at Diodone Save, we're going to take a detailed look at John Browning's handguns design from their beginning all the way to uh, the end. We're going to take a look at Leon Hubert's handgun designs uh, while he was at FN. Um, both John Browning and Leon Hubert um, designed more handguns at FN than Diodone Save did. Diodone Save designed uh, actually two uh, during his time there, or at least two that got uh, produced. Um, Le uh, Diodone Save was also the designer of the Fowl Rifle. Um, originally the FN model in 1949 that evolved into the Fowl Rifle. He is the uh, designer credited with the FN P35 and the Baby Browning and the Double Stack Magazine. And I'll tell you one of the really super impressive things about Diodone Save is the way that he altered and modified and improved um, John Browning's um, designs, specifically his full auto designs um, and their slide cycle rate. In other words, he was able to get more out of John Browning's designs than the designs originally, originally were capable of in terms of how many rounds per minute can be fired uh, from, um, you know, things like a, a light 30 machine gun or a 50 cal. Um, and so Diodone Save is, was a great designer in his own right, of course. Um, but he had some, um, I guess you'd say shortcomings compared to 
is uh, uh, the two designers who came before and after him at FN. And we're going to talk about that. And uh, we'll be we'll be pretty uh, kind of blunt uh, about it and uh, and show you what what is really the most appropriate answer, I guess, to this question is the high powers beaver tail dysfunctional. Here's where it all started. Mr. Browning um, started with semi-auto handguns with this handgun design. You can still find this handgun occasionally on gunbroker.com and other online auction sites. And from what I've been told, most of them still work. And you're talking about 120 plus something years later after this handgun would have been produced. Any of that you see today, it's phenomenal that um, these things are still working. This is John Browning and what he was famous for. But particularly, what we're looking here for is the design Mr. Browning went with in this area of the frame, okay? And what I want you to imagine, you see where this slide is, is coming back above approximately right here. This level with the frame above there, that is going to be the hands, the shooting hands, no-go zone. The hand has no business going there. That's the slides and the actions territory. Likewise, above this or below this line, if we imagine the line right across here, below that is the actions, no-go zone. <clears throat> this keeps the hand and the action affirmatively away from each other. It keeps the shooter's hand safe. And that's how Mr. Browning did it uh, from the beginning. Also around 1900, Mr. Browning sold a, a design to Colt. And it was this one, the Colt model 1900. That was chambered in 38 uh, ACP, a John Browning uh, design invention. The first uh, FN we just saw 32 ACP, again, John Browning designed or invented that cartridge as well. This 1900 model has some similarity to the high power, uh, has some similarity to the high power pistol. I've never seen this hammer cocked and what it looks like uh, when it is cocked. I just know that uh, Browning's designs did not have a reputation for injuring the user. Um, continuing with some things Colt, um, this one is the 1908 Pocket Hammerless, again, a Browning design. And around 1903, actually, we saw Browning introduce on the FN 1903 model um, the grip safety. And this grip safety, not only is it a manual safety in and of itself, but because you must press affirmatively in this direction with the hand, um, it is highly unlikely anybody's going to be trying to migrate their hand up and over this area into the hand's no-go zone. Um, at the same time, pressing in on this beaver tail. So, I'm um, sorry, on, on the grip safety part of the frame. This became a favorite way of Mr. Browning for dictating the positioning of the hand on the grip frame. And when you think about it, the design is controlling the positioning of the hand. It's keeping the hand safe is, is what it's doing. It's also keeping the firearm in a safe condition until a hand is wrapped around to press the grip safety and, um, and disengage the grip safety so that it can in fact be fired. Um, we see a generous amount of material here that does go fully under the slide itself and the action. And that is critical to keeping the action and the hand in each of their own uh, no-go zone from a design perspective. 1905, Mr. Browning, and I'll tell you, this man was a absolute machine for uh, churning out designs that were just stone cold perfect as, as design work could be. Um, 1905 vest pocket pistol, you can pretty much kind of fit two of these in your hand uh, side by side. <clears throat> and 25 ACP, he invented that too. But for being such a small handgun and to have no reputation of slide bite, we have to start looking, well, how come? You have a grip frame here, you can wrap one finger around this, it gets small fingers, maybe one and a half or one and three quarter fingers you can wrap here. The tendency 
in a gun this size is to try to hold as high as you can to control it. Um, he put a grip safety. That grip safety must be depressed this way. If you're pressing the web of your hand this direction, you're not going up here. Um, we also noticed that at the top of the frame, he flattened that area out and it is under the slide and the action. And again, it's a very tiny handgun. It has no reputation for um, uh, the hand and the slide co-mingling too closely with each other. In 1906, it was modified, they have a manual safety that was added and a slide lock back notch using the manual safety. Again, the grip safety, the frame design stayed the same way. Again, no reputation for slide bike that we know of anyway. 1910, Mr. Browning's 32 ACP or 380 ACP. 1910 model. Again, he stayed with the grip safety. He's got good affirmative area uh, here for the hand to stay separated from the uh, from the slide and from the action. And um, this one, this one is um, uh, I, I own one of these handguns, and I mean, there's just no question when you fire this uh, and wrap your hand around it. Um, you're not going to be depressing that grip safety and getting that hand up in the way of the slide uh, at the same time. I don't think anybody's hand is that, uh, is that uh, capable all in one hand to go two different directions like that. Um, then the model 1911. Now this is an interesting one because this is the first time that we actually see the grip safety also doubling as the beaver tail, so to say. It's kind of doubling as the beaver tail. There's a beaver tail of the frame. And you watch this, there's the beaver tail of the frame, runs up like that. Then the original grip safety basically followed the profile of the frame. And it was not this, you know, enhanced, you know, deal where it's intended to hide the hammer or whatever. Um, this was, uh, this was to be as as uh, compact and to keep the dimension of the handgun um, smaller, not larger in this area. And but this is the first time. Now, you, interesting thing here: if you just so happen to be ridiculous about how you hold a handgun and you want to start wrapping your hand up over this area, and you do that, you're going to be pressing up here on a beaver tail, which is going to press it out down here and means you're not going to be able to fire the weapon. You have to have the hand here. You have to be affirmatively pressing the beaver tail or this thing can't function. If you're pressing the beaver tail this way, you're not probably wrapping your hand also up over in this area. Again, Browning controlling the position of the shooter's hand in order to keep the action and the hand um, apart from each other. John Browning's uh, continued design legacy in, the around, in or around 2015. This is the Colt Woodsman 22 long rifle target pistol. Um, John Browning said that all of his designs started with the breech area. That would be in this area right here. And you can see it's essentially the same handgun uh, that uh, FN did, slightly refined uh, design, but it is uh, the same. Take a look. We start to see these um, these themes, if you will, in Mr. Browning's design work. Um, at the top of the grip frame where the hand goes, it extends back, it gets kind of flat here, and it is fully under the action uh, that's happening right above the hand. The action stays in its, uh, in its zone, the hand stays in its zone, and they stay out of each other's no-go zone, and, uh, and life is good. The FN model 1922. This was a remake, uh, kind of a remake of the 1910. They uh, lengthened the grip frame to add more uh, magazine capacity and they added an extension on to the front of the barrel. You've got the grip safety here. You've got the defined area for the hand, uh, just like on the 1910. And then Mr. Browning's last uh, handgun design, the 1927 Grand Rendiment. And this is where things get interesting because no longer is there a grip safety going on in the picture anymore. So um, no grip safety, keeping the hand in any particular area for any particular reason. Um, this is a picture of the Grand Rendiment that I believe hangs in the uh, Browning Museum. 
it was a breech bolt design and there was also another version in a hammer fire design the breech bolt design this would be the breech bolt protruding out the back of the handgun under the breech bolt there is this kind of a flat area and that is again defining the no-go zone for both the mechanicals and for the hand and we'll show that to you there now the reason we're showing this to you primarily is because history shows us that this question was a thing back then uh, regarding the design that ultimately was adapted to become the P-35 or the high power. Um, one of Mr. Browning's, uh, the pictures of Mr. Browning's early prototypes of the breech bolt design uh, doesn't really show the breech bolt extending out quite as far out of the slide as on the, uh, on the uh, one here. However, um, in that case, you don't really have that extra part and I'm showing right here. That is not in the picture. Later, it became in the picture. And um, so this was a this was a thing. And it wasn't only a thing with uh, Browning. It was a thing with FN. Because when we take a look at um, FN's uh, picture of a 1922 prototype of the 1927 Grand, what became called the 1927 Grand Rendiment, we see now hammer fired, the breech bolt is gone, and we see a real high power-ish kind of a beaver tail profile but guess what by 1926 they had added back mr browning's prescription for keeping this hammer and this slide in the hand uh apart from each other so we have to assume that this was a thing um even back then into the diadone savior sorry about the uh clarity of this picture. Here you get the idea. The firearms Diodone Save is credited with uh, designing the Browning High Power, the baby Browning. Uh, interesting, both say Browning. Mr. Browning did not design either one of those handguns. Um, the baby Browning is a different gun than the FN 1905 or 1906 Browning designed vest pocket and the, um, the FN Browning High Power or P-35 um, is not really remotely close to anything that Mr. Browning had um, had done in the 1927 Grand Rendiment by the time Diodone Save was finished with it. And the FN Foul Battle Rifle is credited to Diodone Save, and that's one of his truly, uh, really uh, in, uh, enduring achievements, if you will. Here's This is going to show you what happened with this uh, baby Browning. Now we're going to start to get some clues about uh, some design work by Diodone Save that maybe was not um, as sound, if you will, as John Browning or Leon Hubert's. And um, first of all, the baby Browning with, uh, this would be uh, Mr. Browning's uh, vest pocket, uh, 1906. Behind the baby Browning, we see it got shorter. Um, the uh, trigger got moved a little bit more to the rear and it's a different gun. Uh, uh, the safety, position of the safety uh, was uh, changed completely. But our, for our conversation, this is the important one right here. The grip safety went away. But not only did the grip safety go away, we see this area became abbreviated. This is the area that defines the no-go zone for both the hand and for the action uh, parts above the hand. And it actually got redesigned in a way that angles the hand or encourages the hand to get higher, frankly, um, because it can. Um, here, you're pretty well limited. It kind of stops you right here. Take a look at the, the distance between the bottom of the slide and here. It's obvious that we're talking about a different gun. Um, and Mr. Save's Baby Browning results in, you can Google Baby Browning slide bite as well, and you'll get a little bit of uh, pictures. Here is giving you an example. This is, is a reasonable grip hold with one finger on a Baby Browning, but the skin of the hand 
is right there to the bottom of that slide. The slide's going to come rearward. And, and, and do baby brownings have a problem with slide bite? Yes, they do. I've had had that happen with me several times. I've had baby brownings malfunction, not because of the gun malfunction. It's because the slide got so slowed down by contact with my hand. Um, because you lack the positive hand positioning characteristics of the design that originally existed in the 1905-1906 uh, vest pocket. Here is a picture of a Glock 43. This definitively shows the separation between uh, below this area of the grip frame being the no-go zone for the mechanicals. The mechanicals are not going to be there. Above this area is the no-go zone for the hand. You would be completely ridiculous to try to grip this thing in such a way that the hand gets up in the area of the, uh, of the slide. Not a Glock commercial, but we did want to show this is what we mean by a design that um, creates this separation between the action and the hand. That brings us up to Mr. Sage's um, FNP35 Browning High Power. Now, the interesting thing um, about the P35 is it was another 41 years before I can find an actual new handgun design introduced by FN, and it was a design of Leon Hubert. Uh, Diodone Say was not the productive um, guy that just churned out handgun and long gun designs every year like uh, John Browning. Not even close. Leon Hubert designed more handguns than Diodone Save did. Um, but we get to the FN. Uh, we get to the FN P35. Let's take a look. Really, this looks reasonable. Um, and when you just take a look at everything, the positioning of the hammer, the profile of the grip frame, the beaver tail. <clears throat> this does not, at first glance, look like a handgun design that could have defects in this area or, or dysfunctionality in this area or actually injure uh, the user. There's, we're getting into the Leon Hubert design years. Here's Leon Hubert here, my partner Slav Barucci, having one of our trips to uh, Leon's office. And we had a poster of uh, Leon is the credited designer with the betterments and upgrade modifications of the uh, high power Mark III S that started in around 1989. Leon Hubert was also responsible for the FN competition model, which included a longer barrel and an extension here. Um, a fully adjustable rear sight, which is uh, as functionally perfect as any uh, rear adjustable rear sight that I've ever you know, personally used. That again, Leon Hubert. This is how the uh, FN competition model, this was the potential for how it could look. This is how they did look. And I always thought that was just a, kind of an ugly gun. Uh, but it didn't have to be, and uh, so we included this version, and uh, uh, that's, again, a design uh, modification or advancement, if you will, of the uh, FN high power design to a competition model, and Leo Hubert was responsible for that. 1976, 40, 30, let's see, 41 years after the P-35, um, FN introduced a new design firearm, and it is a Leon Hubert design. And this firearm single-handedly changed the course of firearms history. And let me explain to you real quickly why. Um, FN wanted into the double-action, single-action market that had started to become a thing. This was the pioneering gun of double-action, single-action at, uh, at FN. And... If it looks familiar, it should, because it's, it, it is a virtual carbon copy with the exception of, you know, an empty slide area up here that Beretta did in the Beretta 84, and they reworked the safety in this area. However, it is the same handgun. Leon Hubert designed this at FN, and in the 70s, FN did not have any production capacity to be taking on the production of this handgun themselves, so they shopped it and Beretta was in the market. And, um, and when 
when that deal went down, Beretta was the manufacturer of the FN140VA or the Browning VVA380, and they did their own Beretta 84. And guess what? The Beretta 92 that, that our military used for <clears throat> uh, 40 years, 35 years, um, so much of the Beretta 92 was copied directly out of the technology of the Browning BDA 380. This um, uh, Leon Hubert um, pioneered what is called a direct feed barrel. Um, that was first seen in the uh, in the Browning BDA 380. And, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes designers have fingerprints, and this is what we would call God and God's grandson's uh, <laughs> fingerprints. Take a look at that similarity. Um, John Browning's 1911 on the left, Leon Hubert's BDA 380 on the right. And the manner in which they kept the profile of the rear of the gun as brief as possible. Um, and I want to show you something else. As we started this study, here's something that we noticed. It's not a guarantee ever. However, having the where the hammer ends inside the beaver tail area, in other words, not out here, that has an impact about the safety of the shooter's hand uh, as well, or it's, a, it's an early clue we discovered. Uh, Leon Hubert moved the hammer even further forward and gave more margin for the hand uh, as we're going to see. And what that looks like in the hand is this. And of course, it's inconceivable that this hand is going to have an issue with hammer bite. In fact, you can imagine the line going right through there and the hand is staying out of its no-go zone. The hammer and the action up here is going to stay out of its no-go zone, which would be below a line imaginary right there. And so this is this was uh, not really a question. Now, here's where the original question in this session gets confusing, because remember the original question. Is the FN Browning High Powers beaver tail dysfunctional? Leon Hubert's handguns designs, handgun designs have no reputation for hammer bite or injuring their user. Here is the FN BDA, uh, BDA-9, sometimes called the HPDA, that is Leon Hubert. And take a look at how brief he is with this beaver tail area. He wanted it to be as low profile as it could be. This handgun has no reputation for hammer bite or injuring the user. So this was actually our first clue, maybe, the FN Browning High Powers original beaver tail is not dysfunctional because if it is, this beaver tail would have to also be dysfunctional because frankly, it is smaller. Um, so that's really what is the giveaway that there's more to this picture than just about, uh, just about the beaver tail. The FN BDA-9 was then made into a compact version with a shorter grip frame uh, a little help on the front of the magazine. The beaver tail on the grip frame stayed the same. Um, these are not high powers. In fact, everything inside this handgun uh, is um, redesigned uh, by Leon Hubert, including the double action, single action um, aspect, a much brawnier, more authoritative extractor, um, and these handguns have no history of either hammer bite uh, or function problems, extraction problems, if you will. Um, during these design years, the market had gone heavily towards double action, single action. It seemed like it was going to be the eternal thing at that point. And the motivation for the BDA-9, the motivation for the BDA-380, uh, is because by this time FN was chasing. They were chasing to catch up with the market. Um, they were not being very successful anymore, getting new contracts for high powers all of a sudden. And um, catching up with the market was a thing. The market for a brief period appeared that it was going to be a double action only market. Um, and there was some movement of the market in that direction. So the BDA 
9 was reconfigured into you don't have to have a, a visual hammer it's a it's a flush fit hammer on this design you don't have to have a hammer you can manually manipulate if you're double action only all the time this is the double action only version of the uh, BDA 9 and this is the double action only compact uh, version very very simple it is a long trigger pull like a double action only trigger pull always will be um, didn't need an, a manual safety under those circumstances so again you know it if this beaver tail is dysfunctional then it just uh, automatically begs the question why isn't that beaver tail dysfunctional why isn't this beaver tail dysfunctional how can this one not be dysfunctional if the FN Browning High Powers beaver tail is. And so we're back to the FN Browning High Power. Now, you may have already noticed just by another one of those clues that we just gave. Do you notice how the hammer is rearward of the beaver tail? In other words, the beaver tail, if we drew a straight line vertically up and down, it would come right through there and the hammer is rearward of that. That is a hint or a clue that there's going to be conflict um, and you notice when the uh, large beaver tails, now this is an aftermarket steel beaver tail welded on to the original beaver tail and then smoothed out and finished over. This has been semi-successful. It's a lot of work and I applaud you know, Nighthawk and Novak and Ted Yost and all the rest of them that have welded on beaver tails onto high powers because that is number one, it's complicated, it's difficult work. It's uh, labor intensive and there tends to be a fair share of be backs. And what, what I mean by that is handguns that have to go back and get refinished again because steel expands and you have steel, a weld, steel, and just with normal air temperature up and down, you know, from cold to hot, you're going to have expansion of the steel. Then you got a weld, then you got uh, more steel. Um, and so again, I applaud these companies. It seems like an awful lot of work in order to solve something though, doesn't it? Um, it does conclusively get the hammer forward of the beaver tail without a doubt. And this is a absolute conclusive solution to the high powers, high powers hammer bite phenomenon. Here's how Novak did it and another uh, Nighthawk, Ted Yost. Uh, and uh, and his work here, he was a little he he was able to a little more abbreviate what he did, but it's still a lot of beaver tail. Uh, the Israeli Kareen, uh, the Bulgarian Argus ninety four, um, slightly different beaver tails as you will see. However, you do see that this beaver tail does conclusively create a no go zone for the slide and the action and the hand. And it is, without a doubt, that beaver tail right there above it. That's where the, the action belongs below it. That's where the hand belongs. And of course, you have no hammer bite with that uh, design. Now, by this point, when you start looking at these pictures, you've been given enough information to now you can diagnose what's the problem here. And if you're saying the fact that this hammer is in the mechanical no-go zone. In other words, this part of the hammer, this is in territory that belongs to the hand, that's intended for the hand. The hand is supposed to be there. You don't have to have a ridiculously high grip hold on a high power to suffer from hammer bite. And the reason is because the design dictates that the action is going into the mechanical no-go zone. And everything, imagine right across here, that's where the hand belongs, is below that line. The action does not belong below that line. However, this is a characteristic of the original P35, and it was a characteristic of the FN Browning High Power all the way to the end, believe it or not. Um, there's another spur hammer design. However, you see it. There is no doubt that hammer is encroaching into the mechanical no-go zone into the hands uh, uh, real estate. Here's a bobbed hammer, but what I want you to see is this angle right here. Even with the bobbed hammer, there's no margin between the mechanical no-go zone and the hands territory right there. 
Um, this is a, an attempt, but it doesn't really, uh, it does not really fix the problem. And here's the CZ75, and we're going to show you what CZ did right, because they did two things right. First of all, they took the grip frame right around here. Mm -hmm. And it, that looks like Mr. Browning's work. Um, and uh, it's a little more beaver tail than what I would personally like on maybe you know a, a handgun, but it is effective. It comes up, it creates this flat area, complete definition between the mechanical zone and the hands zone, and look at the uh, and look at the angle of the hammer. Um, we've coined a new phrase about handgun design work as it relates to the hammer and its positioning when it's cocked. That's the hammer's angle of attack. Uh, angle of attack of what well, the firing pin, of course. Um, and CZ just got this right. And, and you never are going to hear about a CZ 75, you know, giving someone, uh, giving someone hammer bite. Um, it is, it is this angle of attack. Those early pictures that, you know, Google has that uh, demonstrate or illustrate high power hammer bite. That is, um, the, the reason for it and what you're seeing is this angle. Show you another look of a comparison between a 1911 with a standard GI beaver tail and a high power ring hammer. Again, from this angle, man, it's obvious. Um, you see how the angle here of the hammer is right down to the top of the beaver tail. The hammer itself encroaches into the mechanical no-go zone. And it's going to go into the territory that that where the hand you know has the uh, has the right to be. F. N. Browning's last designer, Leon Hubert, did solve this with the SFS system for uh, high powers, and there it is. See what a difference the angle of attack is. And I'm not talking about this part of the hammer. I'm talking about this part of the hammer. This has been completely modified and changed because you're getting nothing in there. Um, uh, again, compare here, this angle, and it's closest to the proximity to the beaver tail and then the SFS hammer. That's a solution. You're not getting hammer bite uh, with that hammer. Um, also don't have a long spur or a long ring. Of coming off of the with the SFS system because there are no normal functions with the SFS hammer where you are ever manually cocking or manually decocking the hammer in the traditional way of taking the thumb and grabbing the hammer that that does not exist in the normal manual of arms of the SFS system. This is intended to show you. Take a look. The hammer of the SFS is also inside the beaver tail area, not, you know, out here outside of it. That's a hint visually that you probably uh, are going to be okay. So in conclusion, is the high powers beaver tail dysfunctional? The answer is no. However, this is the important one to understand. The original high power hammer's angle of attack plus the FN High Powers Beaver Tail design does equal a design defect. And together, those two things are dysfunctional and for the reasons that we have stated in this session. Folks, thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Allen, BH Spring Solutions LLC, bhspringsolutions.com for High Power University.